take a look at the paleo diet. You guys uh, read that article from National Geographic, which gave you a little bit of uh, understanding what the paleo diet is, sometimes called the caveman diet or the Stone Age diet. Uh, basically, the argument of the, the paleo diet is that we evolved, um, you know, Homo sapiens evolved for a certain specific kind of diet. Uh, that diet was based on hunting and gathering. Um, and um, agriculture is a relatively recent invention and our body has not adapted to that new diet and we're much better off eating a diet like we had back in the Paleolithic. Uh, that, that's, that's basically the, um, the justification for it. So uh, this is from the uh, Paleo Diet website. And you can see what they're showing is that the number of generations uh, in each part, right? So Homo habilis is it's a pre-modern human, right? When you get up to modern Homo sapiens, right, you can see, uh, you know, there's 6,666 generations. And then since farming is only 366. So they're saying that, um, you know, this is the diet that we were evolved to eat. Um, but we know that that's not con entirely true already because we talked about lactose resistance and lactose tolerance in Europe. And that shows that since farming there has been change, right? That is selection on genes and, um, you know, different frequency and adaption to a new kind of diet. And what you also saw in the National Geographic article um, is that uh, there's a variety of diets out there around the world. There's no one perfect diet for human beings. Uh, humans are quite adaptable um, and there are many kinds of diets that could actually be healthy, right? So you, you saw in the National Geographic diet, uh, article uh, just the diversity of human diet around the world. What is a problem that mo many people agree uh, with, even if they don't agree with the paleo diet, is that uh, we are a more sedentary um, group today than hunters and gatherers and farmers around the world. That is not sedentary as in living in permanent villages, but sedentary as in not getting enough physical exercise, right? So a, a Kung uh, man and woman will get, you know, 600 to 900 burn 600 to 900 calories per day and we typically burn much less than that um, it's more complicated than it looks though um, there's been studies on fat and studies on exercise and um, some people mistakenly believe that you can exercise your way down to let's say a lower weight um, and when uh, Anthropologists have studied with hunters and gatherers. What they found out is uh, when, let's say, the scientist does an activity and then compares the amount of calories that a hunter and gatherer is burning doing the same activity, they find that the hunter and gatherer is actually burning fewer calories doing the same activity. The body adjusts. Uh, so if you're, if you're burning a lot of cal calories doing physical work, uh, your body will adjust and actually eventually burn fewer calories during that exercise. So the, the, um, this is quite complicated. They have also looked at sumo wrestlers and they found out that sumo wrestlers that exercise are quite healthy. The, you know, they could be over what we would consider overweight, but if they're doing physical exercise, they're actually, uh, they're, they're quite healthy. Um, and it also depends on the kind of fat. So diet is very, very complex. But hopefully what you saw is that anthropology has a lot to contribute to the equation. Okay, so with the paleo diet, they basically are saying that anything that's a product of the Neolithic Revolution, anything that's a product of the origins of agriculture is basically off the table. So that includes all cereal grains. So that would include wheat, barley. No beer, no pasta, no bread, no no cake. Um, that would also include um, uh, rice, potatoes, right? All those things were domesticated, as, and we're going to talk about those things uh, next. All right, so let's take a little a look at agriculture outside. We'll come back to the paleo diet and sort of... Um, 
uh, we'll, we'll kind of list the things that are allowed and the things that are, are not allowed. Okay, so when you uh, look at agriculture around the world, you'll see that all these areas that are kind of boxed out independently on their own, domesticated plants and or animals. Uh, so the North America, Central America, South America, uh, Sub-Saharan, below the Sahara, Africa. Uh, we already talked about the Middle East, uh, different parts of Asia. Uh, so um, agriculture is not something that originated in one area and then spread everywhere else, a little bit like what we saw in Europe. Right? Agriculture is something that in different parts around the world was invented and discovered independently. Let's look at some origin of different of uh, some plants. We're going to talk about a few of them, right? Um, we already talked about wheat and barley, but you know, sometimes uh, plants that are very useful today have kind of an interesting origin. So for example, coffee, you know, where does coffee come from? Well, coffee actually comes from East Africa and Saudi Arabia. Um, and in fact, there's a famous port in Yemen called Mocha, which is now a name for a brand of coffee. Uh, Europeans then brought coffee over to uh, Indonesia and grew it in Indonesia. Indonesia used to be called Java. So that's where the other name or one of the other names for coffee comes from, from the island from which it uh, was grown later on. But it originates from East Africa and Saudi Arabia. Apples originate from Kazakhstan, Central Asia. All apples originate from this wild ancestor. Same with apricots. You know, soybeans, obviously, and uh, from Asia. Rice, of course, from Asia. Um, chickens from Southeast Asia originally. We're going to talk about some of these New World domesticates uh, as well. Right. Okay. So, how do archaeologists figure out? Uh, you know, like we saw in the Middle East, how do they figure out when plants were domesticated? What's the kind of evidence that they need to get? Well, one of the important pieces of evidence, of course, is the plants themselves. So, if they can get plants that are preserved well, um, you know, that in a, let's say a dry environment. Then they can compare the seeds to, let's say, the wild version of the plant and modern domesticated versions of the plant and see where along the scale that plant fits, that they found the archaeological deposit. They could also use genetics uh, to compare the genes from their sample to, let's say, the genes of a plant that they know a lot about or have sequenced the genes. Okay, so let's look at Africa. So in uh, we're going to look at Egypt, you know, next week and agriculture in Egypt, but below Egypt, below the Sahara, uh, they independently domesticate plants and also animals. And sub-Saharan Africa, they domesticated two plants that were not domesticated in the Middle East. The uh, one of these plants is usually used to make a beer in West Africa, uh, and it's still made. Uh, used to make a beer today uh, in gluten-free beer. So if you ever see gluten-free beer in the supermarket, chances are it's made from sorghum uh, because it doesn't have gluten, right? So here you can see sorghum. You can see the result. And here's millet over here. The result of human domestication produced a plant with very, very large seeds. How do we know this? Well, it comes from an interesting piece of evidence. Around uh, this pottery dates to about 3000 BC. Uh, and it turns out that when uh, this clay vessel and these, this one over here was made and it was still wet, uh, the ancient people took some uh, sorghum and they, or sorry, millet, and they pressed it on the wet clay to make a sort of design. Uh, and then they fired the clay hard. Um, when archaeologists found this pot shirt, they looked very carefully at the grains of millet and they could tell that the millet that made these impressions was a domesticated version of millet, not a wild version of millet. In different parts of sub-Saharan Africa, East Africa and also West Africa, but especially East Africa, they independently domesticated cattle. Cattle are very important in tribes in Kenya, like the uh, Maasai tribes. You can see a Maasai uh, herder over here. Uh, cattle is essentially the form of wealth in many of these traditional uh, tribes. They independently domesticated cattle. 
Okay, let's go over the Asia. Of course, when you know we think of Asia, we tend to think of rice. Uh, rice was domesticated in Asia, of course. It's it's kind of like a wild grass uh, kind of plant. Uh, it has to grow in marshy areas. It has to grow with a level of water uh, on it. Of course, if you're uh, farming in a place with a lot of topography, a lot of hills, you have to do something so that you can actually grow the food there. And what ancient people uh, did and what people still do in some areas of the world is to build these, what are called terraces. Right, so making these steps in the hill slope, uh, but they have to be supported with some sort of wall to make sure this whole thing doesn't collapse. Right? Okay, now in Asia, uh, it looks like not only was rice important, millet, but also in terms of animals, pigs were very, very important. And pigs um, are a very good animal to raise because they will eat garbage, they will eat anything. Um, they're, they're pretty much omnivorous. So they'll, they will eat meat, they will eat plants, they will eat, they will eat garbage. And so they're kind of like a, a recycling. They get rid of your garbage and they produce meat. So it's actually a very good animal to raise. Uh, and in early agricultural sites in China, they have found, uh, you know, the, 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 um, Shoulder blades of pigs being used for uh, you know, agricultural tools and grinding stones and things like that. Um, an interesting burial that was found from an early Neolithic village in China um, it shows that they had domesticated rice by 9,000 years ago, 7,000 BC. In some of the pottery, they scooped out some of the remains of the contents. It was, you know, hard residue and it turns out that it was an alcoholic beverage that used to be in that vessel uh, today that scientist who discovered that uh, teamed up with the dogfish head brewery and they actually reconstructed um, a beer based on what was found in that vessel uh, some sort of rice alcohol uh, dogfish head has produced a number of these kind of ancient brews uh, which is kind of an interesting use of science Okay, so Africa and Asia. Let's move over to what uh, some people call the New World, right? Obviously, that's kind of a Eurocentric term. Um, we'll use it just for convenience, obvi you, know, um, uh, you know, new, old. They're very outdated terms, but just kind of for ease of use, um, I might use them occasionally. But, uh, so, you know, so instead of Europe, Asia, the Middle East the old world, quote unquote, let's move over to our hemisphere, uh, the new world. So this is so in Central America. We're going to focus on uh, Central America, but we're also going to talk about uh, North America and South America. Right. So let's move over to South America first. Uh, the animals uh, that were domesticated in South America. Well, you probably know the llama and the chinchilla. And they both descend from the guanaco. This is a animal that's very similar to camels. Another uh, animal you might be familiar with is the guinea pig uh, or the chinchilla. Uh, you can see very, very cute, you know, very easy to control. They're you know, large rodents. You can put them in pens. Um, fry them up with a little butter on the side, right? So they are a delicacy still in South America. North America, you should all be familiar, obviously, with the turkey. Um, so in terms of the animals that were domesticated in the New World, North, Central, and South America, there's not that many. Llamas, alpaca, turkey, guinea pig, dogs also, either brought over and then different breeds uh, were, were produced or independently domesticated over here. But in Central America, in the area where the Maya civilization grew up, there were no pack animals of any kind. Anything that had to be transported could only be transported using human labor. Um, and so when you compare the New World to the Middle East, Europe, that we already talked about, it seems like the Old World, the Middle East has a greater variety of animals that were domesticated compared to the New World, right? In the, again, in Central America, you have no domesticated animals. Uh, 
you know, four, uh, three of these animals are in South America. Um, in North America, you have turkeys and dogs, but that's about it. So a greater variety of animals were domesticated in the Middle East and Europe than in the New World. We had in the Middle East, sheep, goat, cattle, pig, then later horse, donkey, uh, camel. All right, so much greater variety. All right, now let's look at plants. We're going to focus in on maize and how maize, or what we call corn, was domesticated in Central America and really changed agriculture in this hemisphere but then later on once it was you know discovered by Europeans quote unquote discovered um, it really changed the dynamics of of a lot of agriculture throughout the world today we consume a lot of corn not specifically as corn itself but byproducts corn starch high fructose corn syrup things like that some chemists estimate that Americans consume more corn chemically or as the, 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 the corn on the cob than even Native Americans did, right? So it's a very interesting crop we're going to go into. Another New World domesticate, very important, at least from my point of view, cacao. This is where chocolate comes from, right? So it's these seeds in a large pod on a tree. It was a very important uh, product in Central America. It was a drink for the elites uh, in the Maya civilization. So what they would do is uh, grind up those cacao seeds. They would use some other um, domesticated plants like chili peppers and things like that to kind of spice the drink up. They would pour this kind of hot beverage back and forth to make it sort of frothy. And then it would be served to a, an elite. Uh, some of you might be able to recognize this plant. This is tobacco, another New World domesticate uh, that, of course, becomes very important all around the world. Uh, when you think of potato, you probably think of Ireland or Eastern Europe. Um, but potatoes were domesticated in South America. That's where they originate from. Um, and actually, potatoes were challenging to domesticate because uh, wild potatoes have a toxin and they're very, very bitter. So this was an intentional process. This was, you know, domestication was not accidental. People had to select for potatoes that were less bitter, replant them, then among that next generation, find potatoes that were uh, less bitter, and so on until they produced domesticated potatoes. And you can see domesticated potatoes have a great variety of color and shape, um, and they're very different from what we find in the supermarket. A lot of times, these kinds of potatoes that you might find, let's say, at a farmer's market, might be called heirloom tomatoes. Uh, you know, heirloom varieties are usually more similar to the original domesticates. Modern potatoes uh, have been selected for their size and their shelf life, not necessarily for their taste. Right? The primary concerns are shelf life because they are moved around the country. Uh, these kind of potatoes might be more flavorful, flavorful, more nutritious, uh, but have a shorter shelf life and they're not as useful for an industrial agriculture that we see in the United States. Uh, they have found different dried up domesticated potatoes in archaeological sites. So we can actually trace the domestication of the potato today in South America in the highland areas of the Andes um, by squeezing the moisture out of the potatoes. Uh, these potatoes can then stay preserved in the dry climate. Another important crop I'm sure you've heard of is quinoa. That is domesticated in the New World as well. And people prefer sometimes quinoa today because it's higher in protein. I think it's gluten-free. Um, so it's become a crop that's more and more popular. It originates in South America. And again, you can see through domestication how productive this plant became. Lots of seeds on each plant. Okay, let's look at the list of the, the plants. Maize. We're going to see that maize, beans, and squash form a three or tripartite um, group. They, uh, as we'll see, uh, were domesticated around the same time, and they're usually referred to as the sister crops. Tomato, another world. New World domesticate. Um, the early European settlers, the English in New England, um, refused to eat tomato, believing it was poisonous. Um, 
I always find it kind of interesting that, you know, tomatoes, tomato sauce, we usually associate with Italy. Pasta in Italy um, originates from, the whole idea of pasta comes from Asia. So spaghetti and tomato sauce is essentially kind of a, a fusion cuisine of New World and Asian. Uh, peppers, sunflower, tobacco, cotton, gourds, right? So similar to... Um, where you'd say gourds and squash, kind of similar to each other, but you could put also in the squash family pumpkins, cacao, chili peppers, avocados. These individuals here in South America, these men, are chewing on the leaf that is a mild stimulant when chewed or used for tea, and it helps them deal with the altitude sickness in the Andes. And this is coca, and this is where cocaine comes from. Uh, by chewing the leaves, you get a, it's a mild stimulant. It would be like drinking a um, Coca Cola. It would you know, which is actually where the name from Coca Cola comes from. Uh, it would be like having a cup of coffee, right? It's pretty mild. Um, cocaine is the heavy, heavily concentrated version that you know is obviously very dangerous as well. Uh, people in these local communities still use coca and they don't want coca to be abolished because it's been part of their culture for for many thousands of years amaranth which is kind of like a grain and the root crops potatoes manioc sweet potatoes right so if you we compare the you know the kinds of animals in the old world versus the new world if you compare the variety of plants in the new world versus the old world you would probably say that there was a greater variety of plants that was domesticated in the New World versus the Old World. In, in the Old World, it's mainly wheat and barley, you know, chickpeas and lentils. Uh, wheat and barley are really the main crops, right? So there's, you know, chickpeas, lentils, there's some other crops. But in the New World, you've got a great variety. And you could say a larger variety than in the Middle East and Europe. Okay, so uh, let's look now at Central America and try and sort of uh, tease out the origins of maize, of corn, and learn a little bit about corn. Okay, here you can see, you know, Mexico and other parts of Central America over here, like Guatemala and, and Honduras. Um, now, if you were an archaeologist, there's really different environments that you could decide to investigate the origins of of maize agriculture up here near mexico city it's high altitude and dry but wet enough for agriculture but pretty dry down here in the yucatan it's it's low elevation and much more tropical and lots of uh, a heavy rainfall now if you were choosing between the two what's the best area to look for the origins of agriculture now, some might people some might say well the tropics because uh, it's so wet there, you know, in ancient times things would have grown well. That could be true, but it would be much easier to find archaeological sites up here where it's dry. Right? So you wouldn't have tropical vegetation covering everything. Um, and also the preservation of ancient plants would be much better in a drier climate. So this is why archaeologists chose this high altitude area to look for the earliest evidence of maize production. Here's a Diego Rivera painting uh, of the use of maize in ancient Mexico. You can see they're cultivating and growing the maize. They're grinding the maize into flour, and then they're producing tortillas, uh, which is a, a traditional uh, food in people, uh, people in Central America. Uh, as we're going to see, maize is an artificial human-produced crop, right? That is, uh, maize will not replenish on its own. If you uh, grow maize and you don't fertilize it and you don't replant the seeds and those cobs fall to the ground, they are not going to grow. The, the, the um, husk is so tightly wrapped around the cob that those seeds are not going to be able to be planted. Right? They're going to wither and dry out and, and that's it. Um, and so humans created a crop that is completely dependent on humans to continue 
which is which is kind of interesting. And when we look at the wild ancestor maze, you're going to see how much of a difference there is. And that's all from human selection. So maize, beans, and squash are usually called the three sister plants in many native communities. Why is that? Well, they actually grow together well in the wild, right? So you can see here, and they would grow together naturally, uh, and they would domesticate around the same time. So they help each other out. Beans have to grow on the substrate. That is provided by the corn stalk. So the beans could grow on the corn stalk. The squash grows on the ground. What does the squash do? Well, the squash actually replenishes certain nutrients in the soil, but it also holds down the topsoil and prevents moisture from evaporating and prevents rain from washing away the topsoil. So the squash holds everything in place uh, and prevents kind of erosion around the corn stalks. Not only that, eaten together, they form a nutritional complement, right? That is corn has amino acids, but it does not have lysine, which is an essential amino acid. Beans have lysine. So in ancient times, when people ate a corn tortilla with beans in it, they were getting a complement of different amino acids together. So there, it was also a, a healthy way to eat, to eat these plants uh, together. So this is why they were kind of domesticated and used together. Okay, what is the wild ancestor of maize? Well, people have used genetics on wild plants in Central America, and they think that the closest thing to modern-day maize is this wild grass called teosinte. And you can see it's very different from modern corn, from modern maize. Very small plant, very hard kernels, not many uh, kernels per plant. So there were a lot of things that people had to change or decided that they were going to change uh, in order to produce something that was very, very plentiful and something that they could really use for agriculture. And we're going to see this took a long time. Right? So teosinte, very different plant. Now, in order to select for certain genes, for certain traits, um, humans cannot control mutations right if something if a mutation appears they can select for it but they can't have a plant make a mutation this is something we can do today by splicing genes onto um, you know the genomes of plants and, and animals this is something we can do but ancient people could not do it uh, so they, they were kind of um, prisoners of the genes of the plants the only thing they could do possibly is what's known as cross-pollination. So if they have two plants, each plant has traits that they like, but the traits are different from one another, they could try and cross-pollinate different strands of, of, let's say, teosinte to see if they get kind of a hybrid plant that has both of those. That's the only thing they could do, is selection and maybe cross-pollination. But what people manage to do is to go from a very small plant, the first domesticated maize, as we're going to see, and to create a larger and larger and larger plant. Obviously, one of the things that they had to create was a cob. A cob so that they didn't just have one stem with these seeds, but a cob that could have many seeds. This is a good example of what the earliest maize looked like. It was still very, very small, as you can see, but a softer case around each kernel and also a cob and larger kernels. These were some of the changes that people selected for and ended up producing a very, very wide variety of maize. Okay, so uh, now let's look at the archaeology of this. How do we know what happened? Okay, well, in that highland area outside Mexico City is an area called the Tehuacan Valley. It's high and dry, and an archaeologist by the name of McNeish wanted to investigate the origins of agriculture in Mexico. So he picked this area to work in, and he picked a number of different sites. Uh, a lot of these sites, some were in the valleys, some were in caves. There were about 12 sites that he found. Uh, not all of the sites had every time period that he was interested in, right? One site might have something from 3000 BC and a level from 1000 BC. Another site might have a level from 6000 BC, but nothing from 3000. Uh, but what he was able to do is by digging enough sites, 
He could put all the levels from all the sites together and create one very, very long sequence. And that sequence went from 1500 AD, from when the Spanish arrived in the New World, to uh, the beginning of the Holocene, around 10,000 BC, the end of the Ice Age. So because of that, he was able to look at all the changes over time during that long period and see how plants like maize were domesticated. So here you can see some of the excavation. In the excavation, he found some of the ancient plants. He found tools that were used to process the plants. So he had a pretty good idea of what was going on. So let's take a look and see what the uh, the overall story is. Uh, you won't have to remember every phase of the story. That is what happened in you know 7,000 BC. You won't have to remember that, but think of it the, in terms of the big picture. So let's look at the big picture. Okay, so back in the Holocene. What was the subsistence strategy of people at this time? What do you think? Obviously, it has to be hunting and gathering because we said before, you know, in the time before agriculture, everyone was a hunter and gatherer, a food collector. That is mobile people that went around to different environments collecting food. Um, it's, you know, it, it's um, subsisting on wild plants and wild animals. And that's what the archaeology showed, uh, that the villages were temporary. Uh, they were only living at sites for a season at a time. They only found plants from a certain season. Another site would show plants from another season. There were jackrabbits and things like that. The, the ice age had ended. The climate had improved. There was more food uh, available, right? And so they were moving around. Uh, and so, you know, each group was about 30 people, something like that. So what happened over time? Well, because there was more food, the population starts to get bigger. So around 7,000 to 5,000 BC, there's a larger population. People are still moving, though. They're still mobile. That's what the archaeology shows. Okay, around 5,000 BC is the earliest domesticated maze. They found archaeological evidence for the very first maze. But this maze is only two centimeters in length. It's not very productive compared to modern maize and in terms of the amount of plants that they found there maize at this point was only 14 percent of the diet and people were still mobile right so um they were still moving around from site to site uh collecting different foods but they had domesticated maize they had domesticated beans they had domesticated squash they were coming back to the sites each year to plant replant these plants and then harvest them uh, later on okay what happens over time well slowly again the population continues to increase now at this point um, domesticated foods like maize and beans are about 30 percent of the diet uh, the, the other percentage of their diet are wild foods and they're still mobile All right then around 1500 bc three and a half thousand years after they first domesticate maize um, now they are fully sedentary living in villages all year round and maize is and other agricultural crops are 40 percent of the diet and you can see how the maize changed over time in the Tehuacan Valley and the other kinds of tools that McNeish found. Okay, well, let's compare the old world and the new world. Right? Okay, in terms of sedentism, when people become sedentary and when they domesticate plants. Why don't you pause the video and just r see if you can figure out the answer to this question. Write it down if you can. What is the order of events in the Middle East when we were looking at the origins of agriculture there in terms of when people settled down and when they domesticated plants? What came first? What came second? In the New World, what came first? What came second? Becoming sedentary or domestication? How do these compare to each other? Okay, so pause the video now. See if you can write that down. Come right back after that. Okay, well, hopefully you remembered that in the Middle East, people settled down first in the Natufian, and then they domesticated plants. 
In the New World, they domesticated plants and were still mobile. They only settled down three and a half thousand years later. So domestication comes first in the New World. Sedentism comes next. So the way plants and animals are domesticated is not the same all around the world. So why did it take so long uh, for people to settle down in the New World? What do you think? Why do you think it took so long? Well, you could kind of see a little bit here because the first domesticated maize was not productive enough for them to actually settle down. It took a long time, right? In 1500 BC, the corn was this size, right? So from 1500 BC, through the process of selection, they produced a larger and larger cob. And the, this, the, these domesticates in 1500 BC could be 40% of their diet at that point because it was productive enough. In uh, 5000 BC, this was only 14% of their diet. Right? Okay, so it took a long time to domesticate maize to get to that large size. And that's why it took so long to settle down. Now, why did it take so long to domesticate maize to become so large, right? To get the first domesticated maize and to get it larger and larger. Why did it take so long? You could see, you know, that's a pretty big difference. You don't see that kind of difference in wheat and barley. The reason why it took so long is the genetics of the maize plant, right? There are about 10 maize chromosomes that are involved in these changes, right? So that means, you know, if you're selecting for mutations on one or two genes, it's not going to take very long for a new variety to appear that you can select for, right? But if you're talking about mutations on 10 different chromosomes, uh, then you know it's going to take a much longer time. So it had nothing to do with the people. It was all really associated with the genetics, right? Okay, so let's go back to uh, the paleo diet. Now that we um, talked about agriculture outside of um, the Middle East and Europe, what sort of things can you eat and cannot eat in the paleo diet? In the paleo diet, you can't eat any ag agricultural product. So that means everything that has been domesticated. So all those things we talked about, potatoes, maize, wheat, barley, rice, right, out, and all of the things made from them. Uh, you cannot eat uh, peanuts because peanuts are actually a legume. They're not a nut. Um, obviously, sugar and things like that are out. So what can you eat? You can eat meat. You can eat fish. You can eat some vegetables. That's about it. All right. So uh, some people do not recommend the paleo diet because it is very restrictive and hard to maintain. Some people do not recommend the paleo diet because uh, if you're eating a lot of meat, you can actually develop things like arteriosclerosis. The kind of meat we eat today is not the same as the meat they were eating back then, unless you're doing your own hunting. Right? Um, the fish that we eat today is different from the fish that people had back then. So it's very hard to eat like a hunter and gather from so long ago. Plus, they had, as you saw in the National Geographic article, a very narrow view of what a hunter and gatherer diet is. There's a lot of variability around the world. The other important part is we cannot go back in time, right? We cannot have large societies that will be able to survive on the paleo diet because it's not productive enough. It's not efficient enough in terms of the use of the land. Uh, we depend on carbohydrate rich crops to feed lots of people. Um, so there really is no going back. But can you live on agriculture and be healthy? Yes, of course you can. Uh, one recommendation is the Mediterranean diet, uh, which many people think is a healthy version of um, eating an agricultural diet. Right? Okay, so agriculture sets up a number of things that are possible. Because you have surplus, because populations get bigger, societies get larger, and a number of changes are possible. In the next video, we're going to look at these changes.